Uh, today I'm excited to have Maxwell Alexander Drake. Uh, he is an award-winning science fiction fantasy author, a graphic no novelist, and playwright. He was also the lead fiction writer and game story consultant for Sony's massive online game EverQuest Next, as well as writing for the Shadowrun game. Drake teaches creative writing at writers' conferences and fan conventions all over the world and is the author of Drake's Brutal Writing Advice series, which is awesome. I can attest. I've been reading the books and I just love them. So, uh, yeah, so you can, uh, for more information, you can uh, check out uh, maxwellalexanderdrake.com or for his writing tra training website, you can go to drakeu.com. And so thanks so much for being here, Drake. This is awesome. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, um, you know, I, uh, I've, I've been reading your nonfiction books and I, there's so many amazing insights there for writers that are learning, uh, to write. And so this is, this is going to be such a wonderful chat. It's just gonna, I just really think it's going to help so many fiction writers to really get inside, um, the mind of the reader, right. And to connect with them. So, uh, would, would you share kind of, maybe we'll start maybe back more at the beginning, but would you share how you started writing fiction? You know, who's your inspiration and, you know, your favorite genres to write in, that sort of thing? Well, traditionally, I only write sci-fi fantasy. Uh, that's on the non, or the fiction side, obviously. Um, and it, it really is my passion. It is, you know, they say, write what you love, and I'm a firm believer of that. Uh, you need to be your first biggest fan. We all write in a circle. And what I mean by that is every genre, in my opinion, is a circle of readers. And some, you know, some genres are tiny and some genres are huge. Like romance is obviously the biggest circle that exists out there. Um, but I'm a firm believer that you should be at the center of your circle. So when I read my stuff, uh, I love it. Uh, because I am my biggest yeah. and first fan. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, I read I read The Hobbit when I was probably nine, eight, nine years old. It was when I read The Hobbit, um, moved on into The Chronicles of Narnia and read that. Uh, found Conan pretty early, probably 10, 11, <laughs> I found the Conan series. Yeah. <laughs> and I pretty much never looked back from there. Uh, so I've always been a fantasy fan. I've always been a fantasy reader. Uh, you know, started playing Dungeons and Dragons at about eight or nine years old uh, with some older kids. Kids. They were all, you know, 12, 13, 14, which to me, they might as well have been 30. So I've always been in the fantasy genre. And, I, and, and so that's what I traditionally write. And so even though I've written so many different things, it's it's all still in that sci-fi fantasy. So like the musicals that I've written um, are, you know, fantasy based or in that, at least in that guise, same thing with the movies and, and everything like that. Like the musical that I'm currently working on is, a, uh, is called Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sheep? Oh. So... Uh, still in that kind of zombie fantasy type mode. Uh, the TV show that uh, we're working on the pilot right now is a is a fantasy base. It's actually the the elevator pitch is it's it's a cross between South Park and Game of Thrones. Oh, so awesome. you know you can chew on that for a while and yeah. figure let your mind go. <laughs> uh, definitely TVMA, but yeah. uh, but still in that fantasy zone. So even though I'm slipping because traditionally my uh, epic fantasy is very dark. I tend to write dark epic tragedies um and i do like that but it's funny that's not my actual personality my personality is very goofy and very silly and 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 so on and so forth um matter of fact one of my favorite uh fan inter uh, interactions was early in my career this this girl came up and i was chatting to some fans at the table and just goofing off and because that's what i do i'm a goofy guy and she i saw her out of the corner of my eye but she wasn't approaching the table she's like five eight feet away and she stood there for a long time until she finally came over and she was like are, are you you know maxwell alexander drake and i'm like well that's what the booth says and she said well it's just not what i expected and i was like uglier and she's like no i just i just I expected somebody very morose and very depressed uh, because of, you know, what you write. And I was like, if you buy my new book, I'll slip my wrist. Will that make you feel better? <laughs> so it's, I, I, I like, I have a sick sense of humor and I just think that, uh, that, you know, and that's kind of this TV show I'm uber excited about because of the fact that I get to show that side of Drake. Uh, not the very serious, you know, there's very few jokes in, in what I write um, uh, for the most part. You know, you do have those uh, those tension breaking jokes. Yeah. Uh, so those are there because that's a that's a normal thing that humans do. We do that. Um, 
I have a, a friend who's a highway patrol officer and, uh, you know, he was talking about, yeah, we kind of get in trouble sometimes because we're at these horrible scenes and somebody oh. will make a joke. Mm -hmm. But he's like, but you got to understand, we see this stuff every single day and, and doing the jokes help us deal with the emotional ramifications yeah. of having to deal with this stuff. So, you know, as a writer, uh, especially of serious uh, literature, you know, serious fantasy, um, I make sure that, that I do add those things in, but I don't get silly and crazy, which is really where my love and my passion is, you know, like the TV shows that I watch and all that. Uh, like I was uber excited for the Orville to come out cause I've been, you know, waiting for that show for like three months. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, that's what this TV show kind of gives me the chance. As far as when I started writing, uh, I actually wrote my first book when I was 12. Uh, wow. It was about 45,000 word book. It's called the warlord's dust. It is a wonderful tale that no one will ever read because it was written by a 12-year-old, and it's really terrible. <laughs> but I still have – actually, a piece of it got published uh, a couple years ago. Uh, there was an anthology that wanted me to, to be in it, and I didn't have time. And uh, I had written this – I don't even know why I did it, but I had written this weird uh, – prequel to or pre, uh, prologue kind of the story of this bard coming into this town and setting up and telling a story to children and then it broke and it went into the actual tale so i was kind of like pretending that the bard was telling the tale not in the tale itself but in that small piece and so um i actually just edited the, the tar out of that and then i wrote a second piece of that which would fit at the end of it so I was the opener and the closer of all these different short stories. And it was kind of like I was doing the same thing where my bard was the one telling all these tales yeah. to the reader. Um, oh, and then at the good. end, and so I actually rewrote it because I knew who Ed Greenwood was actually the first story, which was really awesome. I love being that I'm in a book with Ed Greenwood. Uh, he's the guy who created Forgotten yes. Realms. Yeah. Um, so I actually tied it in, you know, I changed it to where the bard kind of said, this is the story I'm going to tell you and, and kind of tied it into Ed's story. And then um, the last story, I even came out of it and tied it into that last story as if, you know, he had just finished telling that story. So I thought it was really cute. Um, but I did have to edit the living tar out of it <laughs> just to get it to, uh, to my level now. Yeah. Um, but so I've been writing forever. I mean, I'm almost 50. Um, it's, it's been a long time coming. I never thought I would do it professionally. It was never something that I had planned to do. I mean, you get married, you have kids, you have a house note, you have car note. This industry has a 99.9% .9 failure rate. I know everyone's trying to break into it and everybody's like, oh, I'll write a book and make a million dollars. No, you won't. This industry is very difficult and very hard to make a living at. Uh, so I never really thought about doing it professionally. Yeah. Um, I was actually in my mid thirties before I got my first fiction uh, published and they were some short stories. And then I kept kind of poking at that. And um, it was, um, I guess I was early forties, 40, 41 when my first novel got published. Mm -hmm. So uh, pretty late in life, but I, I do believe this is an old man's game or an old woman's game. Not yeah. to be sexist. You write from our own well of experience. And yeah. yeah, there are those exceptions. There's those few younger people who have written brilliant books. But the reality is, is that when you're creating these characters, you're creating entire lives within them. And if you haven't lived a life, then it's harder for you to kind of imagine what it would be like to be these other people. So, you know, if you look through the history of writing, most writers are 30s uh, at, at the youngest and 40s is really kind of the the staple, which is really funny in today's industry because the the work world has changed. The yeah. work world has changed to be, no, no, if you're not 22, we're not hiring you. And I yeah. think the publishing industry is starting to fall into that trap where they're like, oh, no, we've got to hire young. Yeah. But this is an, an older person's game. I'm not poo-pooing on younger people. I would kill to be 22 again. The reality is, is that yeah. you do need some life experience. You do need to have lived to be able to... Uh, you know, translate that into your stories. And I do believe that it is an older person's game. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. The whole life experience. See, definitely yeah. you put that in your fiction, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and it's not that younger people can't. I mean, again, I wrote my first book when I was 12. Yeah. You, you can definitely do it. Yeah. Um, you know, Aragon was written by a 16 year old. Yeah. And they made a movie out of it. So yeah. I'm not saying you can't write young. I'm just saying that uh, it's really not a when I say that, I always feel like I'm digging on the younger people, and it's not for you. That statement is not for you. If you're younger and you're listening to this, that's not for you. It's for older people who are terrified that they're starting too late in life. So you are young, and you have your whole life ahead of you. Get over it. You've got plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> the older people, like me, who are like, holy crap, I'm in my 40s, and I'm going to 
start a new career yeah. that has a 99% failure rate? <laughs> what am I, an idiot? So it's for you guys to say, no, actually, you know, you're starting at about the right time. At the, about the right time, yeah. No, that's yeah. good. That's good. Well, uh, so, you you know, you've, you've had a lot of success as a fiction author as well as a nonfiction author. And, you know, you give these cool educational seminars at Gen Con Writers Symposium and other places. And, um, you know, I've read your nonfiction books, which, you know, just super helpful, uh, like the dynamic story creation. I just, um, I'm going to have to go through it again because <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, I know that there's, I always have to read, especially nonfiction books twice to really get the, um, soak it in, I guess. Right. And, uh, you know, so, you, you know, would you talk about, um, you know, in, in your book, you do mention mindset and expectations, which I guess we kind of started on. Um, we did? Yeah. But, would, would you, you know, would you talk about how uh, writers need to pivot their thinking so they can, you know, write specifically for their readers and to, you know, sort of give them that emotional satisfaction, which, you know, as readers, that's kind of what we're looking for. But. Yeah, actually, um, before then, you, you touched on something that I actually want to state that I thought was funny. Um, so the dynamic story creation came out last year and it's running a four, 4 4.9 out of five stars, which, you know, is great, yes. especially for my very first nonfiction. But so when I wrote it, so how I teach when I'm teaching live, I'm kind of a goofy guy, as I've already stated. So when I get up on stage, I kind of, you know, do it in a more goofy manner. And, and I'm definitely a blue collar, um, teacher. I'm a blue collar writer. Now I do think that I look at writing deeper than most people, even people that have gone and gotten their MFA in college. Mm -hmm. I still think I look at writing at a deeper level than a lot of those people. Not all of them. There are some brilliant people out there, but most aspiring writers in today's world don't, they don't have any education. They don't have anything. And the, and the biggest problem is, is that they go, well, I can speak English. So obviously I can write a New York times bestseller yeah. and speaking English and writing creatively are about as similar in my opinion as speaking French and writing Japanese. They're yeah. almost like they're from different bases. Um, so when I went to write that book, one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to make it entertaining. I wanted, you know, I'm especially dynamic story creation, which is all theory. It's all story structure theory. It's all business mm -hmm. theory. It's all, you know, it's, it's, it's the invisible layer, the physical layer, which I think we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But it's, it's some very high-end complicated stuff to think about and I break it down in a very layman's way mm -hmm. so that anyone can consume it. Um, but I wanted to make it very personal. Uh, so I wrote it in a very tongue in cheek kind of way in a very entertaining way. Matter of fact, somebody, some, one of the reviews said, uh, if Deadpool ever wrote a book on creative writing, it would be this book, <laughs> which I think is hilarious because <laughs> just the thought of Deadpool writing a book on writing. Um, but then that's kind of the, the thing. And, and I did it you know, on purpose that way, because I wanted it to be entertaining as you consume this stuff. But it did. So this year I'm on tour yeah. now that the book's been out a year. Yeah. So I now have people who've read it and are yeah. coming up and talking to me about it. And there was over and over and over again, there was an unexpected consequence to this that I just, I, I can't believe happened. And I think it's hilarious that it happened. But people would come up to me and they would say, yeah, I actually had to read the book twice because the first time I read it, I got to the end and I went, oh crap, I was supposed to be learning. And they just, they, they enjoyed the read so much <laughs> that they forgot to take notes and to, to go, oh, he's talking theory here. I should probably pay attention because they just enjoyed my antics and just the stupidity of, of just going through it. And they were like, so I had to reread it a second time with, and force myself to slow down and go, okay, don't enjoy this. Just pay attention to the, the structure. So that was it was kind of unintended. I mean, it's cool because it is. it's a book on theory. Yeah. <laughs> like you shouldn't enjoy reading that as you're getting to the end. Um, and then I, I hope that I've done the same thing with the book that came out this year, which is much more practical. It's on its uh, point of view. Um, what's the point? Or if you prefer stronger writing through better narrative. So I go into the more practicality of writing and how to hold your narrative, what works, what doesn't, all the tricks and tips and all that. Yeah. So as opposed to theory of the first book, this is much more practical, but it's still written in the exact same way. It's still written in my, you know, conversational kind of in your face, uh, um, tongue in cheek kind of, you know, little snarky. Man. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so see, we'll see if people have the same thing. Cause again, there's such dry topics yeah. um, that I want them to be entertaining. I want you to enjoy the time that you spend with me. Cause they're big too. Most, that was another thing that everybody was like, 
you can't put out a creative writing book. I mean, dynamic story creation is almost 75,000 words. And they're like, you can't put out a, a book on theory that's 75,000. Nobody's going to enjoy that. Nobody's going to be able to slog through that. And so far, it's been fantastic. And yes. then the second book is 100,000 words. <laughs> so it's it's even bigger <laughs> on one topic. You know, we're just talking about point of view for 100,000 words. <laughs> and it's actually running a five of five stars. Yeah. Um, so it's... I don't know. It, it worked out really well, I think, and and I think it's an enjoyable way to consume the these very high end topics. Yeah. Um, but getting on to your question, yeah, I believe, I, and I and I talk about it in the book. I believe that one of the things, and, and this happened to me all the time when I was coming up through the ranks and going to writers groups and going to writers conferences and and learning the craft and mm -hmm. honing my skill. I heard time and time and time again from people that were around me, oh, I don't I don't write for other people. I write for me. And if they don't like it, they can piss off. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me. And then, you know, once I made that transition from amateur to professional, it really didn't make any sense to me because I get paid from those other people. Like to have this attitude of screw the other people, I write for me, well, like you're writing for them. So my background is in cooking. My family owned uh, restaurants and I grew up, you know, in a five star uh, kitchen. And so I do a lot of the cooking. Matter of fact, I do all the cooking in the house. Not true. When I'm away on the road, my wife does cook. She cooks Olive Garden and McDonald's. And if pans are going to get used in our kitchen, it's going to be me who does them. Um, she, she loves that joke. <laughs> Not really. Um, but I do. I do think of, of writing uh, I equate it to to being a chef. Mm -hmm. You know, as a chef, I'm not cooking a meal for me to eat. I'm not going to eat every single meal I cook and, and enjoy it for me. Yeah. I'm cooking it for other people. And if you've ever gone to a, a four or five star restaurant, a lot of times those chefs come out and they come to your table and they're like, so I just prepared this for you. You know, what is your opinion of it? Did you like it? Is it what you wanted? Yeah. Because it's about the person who bought the dish. They're the ones that are either going to enjoy it or not. And if they don't, they're not coming back. Yeah. So if you're writing for yourself, like what's the point? Just don't just keep it on your computer. Don't put it on the web. Don't self publish it. Don't try to submit it. To, like you're writing for you, then you're the only reader. So just keep it on your computer and reread it. <laughs> I do believe that it's a mentality shift that that you have to shift from I'm writing for me to I'm writing I'm writing words, fictitious words about mm -hmm. fictitious characters and fictitious events that somebody's going to give me money for. Yeah. I'm going to pay my bills by writing fake stuff. I mean, I'm not writing political speeches. I'm not <laughs> writing medical journals. I'm not teaching anybody how to, you know, save the world. I literally am chopping people's heads off and, you know, <laughs> have dragons bite people in half. Like, like this is yeah. crazy stuff that I'm getting paid to do. Uh, I should probably do a really good job at it. Yeah. So, you know, that's I, that's what I believe. And I believe that as a professional you know, that's kind of the first step. And that's what I talk about uh, in in the beginning of the book. But then I go deeper and I start uh, explaining the the next step. Once you kind of get over the fact that you're not writing for you anymore, you're writing for others. Well, you have to understand those others now. So you have to start mm -hmm. thinking about why the fans are there. Why are they giving you money? Yeah. And that's why I differentiate between having a fan mentality and having a professional mentality. So the, the one that I like to use because most people have seen it and most people like it is Finding Nemo. Yeah. And I, so when I'm in a class, I'll say, so you've seen Finding Nemo. You know, how, you, know you liked it. And everybody's like, yeah, we liked it. And then I go, why? Why did you like it? Why did it work? Yeah. And normally in the classroom, everyone's like, uh, it, 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 it had a, a cool stone turtle. <laughs> Are you going to put a cool stone turtle in everything you write from here on out? Because that's what made no. So <laughs> like you have to go further. You have to stop thinking like a fan and you have to start looking at, you know, it really comes down to that invisible layer, you know, without a theme, you have no story. You cannot be successful if you don't understand what storytelling is. And it's about delivering a message. And that's that invisible layer. And that's why it's so confusing. And why I call it the invisible layer, that's a term that I made up. I, I've made up the physical layer and the invisible layer. And what I mean by that is the physical layer is everything that is in the story. It's your characters, your plot, and everything like that. Right. The invisible layer is the message. Yeah. The, the funny thing is, is, and the reason why I call it the invisible layer, is you never actually say any of the invisible air. So like uh, the example I always use is um, in the Pied Piper. The Pied Piper yeah. is a story about not breaking promises. However, the word promise is never mentioned in the story of the Pied Piper. Mm. It doesn't need to be. The yeah. physical ear is going to deliver that yeah. 
because it's invisible. You can't slam the, the readers in the face with, yeah. okay, so this story is about breaking promises and why it's bad. So mm -hmm. I'm going to show you people breaking promises and I'm going to show you why it's bad. And then here they are, they're breaking promises and see how it's bad and don't break your promise. You can't do that because now you're preaching and, and readers can be like, eh, I don't, don't want to read you ever again because yeah. you're preaching at me instead yeah, exactly. of you know, organically giving that message. Yeah. Um, and it's hard. It's hard for people to make that shift. You know, when I say stuff like, oh, did you see, you know, this show? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, what's the theme? And they're like, uh, it, did it have a theme? So that's one of the reasons why on the Drake U uh, website, I'm very excited. I just started last week and I'm going to be doing it every week, but I've started Drake's Brutal Breakdown where, because I consume a lot. I watch two to three hours of something every day. So either TV or movies every single day. I read for an hour to two hours every single day. So four, five, six hours of my day, every day is spent consuming entertainment. But I don't consume, or I play video games. I play a lot of, I mean, I'm in the video game market. So I do play, you know, I've been playing Mass Effect uh, yeah. and Dropping for the last oh. couple of weeks. Uh, but I don't consume these things as a fan. I mean, I do, because I am a, the ultimate fanboy. But I'm consuming them going okay what worked here what didn't work here why did right. it work what was the theme so like i the one that's up on drake you right now the first one was the hitman's bodyguard and so i talk about it and i'm also very interested in the business so i talk about like this is how much money it costs and so much money it made and this is where it was at and if you want more here's a link to where i get my information on yeah. you know the business side and money side because that's interesting to me because i'm in the industry yeah. um but then I get into the story and I'm like, all right, so what is it? What What's the physical layer? What's the structure of the story? Now, what's the invisible layer? What are the themes? Why do they work together? Uh, there's actually something in the movie that I think weakened the invisible layer. And so I talk about that. Um, and, and so that's what I'm trying to do is with the brutal breakdown is I'm not reviewing movies. I'm not going to go, this one was a thumb up and this one was a thumb down. I'm going, here's what worked and what didn't work in this yeah. movie so that you as a professional writer can start to see stories the way I see them and start to be able to go, oh, and then you can use that knowledge to look at your own stories and yeah. go, oh, that's not going to work or this is going to work. Yeah. So... It really is a mindset change, in my opinion, and that's why I spend a third of the book talking about the mindset of a writer. And, and we, I go into a lot more other th uh, a lot of other things as well in it, like um, just how hard the industry is emotionally. And and I, I try to go into that first third of that first book. I started it with the mindset for lots yeah. of reasons. Yeah. Um, and like one of the biggest reasons is I've been doing this professionally full time for ten years, so I go all of these conventions for ten years, and I and every year I meet a huge number of brand new authors and they're like, Oh yeah, I'm going to do this forever. And then I never see them again, ever. Yeah. They're gone. Um, and every, and the next year there's another brand new batch of, of, you know, 20, 30 people that I meet and they're like, yeah, my first book is going to be so awesome. And then I never see them again yeah. because this industry will crush you, especially if you have the wrong expectations. So I talk about expectations a lot in there. Uh, like mm -hmm. the thing I like to say is, you know, let's say your first book comes out and you are hundred percent convinced because your mom loves it. You're a hundred percent convinced it's going to make a million dollars and it makes 300 bucks. Yeah. How are you going to feel? You're going to feel crushed because you knew, you knew it was going to make a million dollars. Like there was no doubt in your mind and then it makes 300 bucks. So you're crushed and you probably quit. However, your first book comes out and you have the expectation, even though your mom loves it, you're like, yeah, no one's going to like this. It's going to be terrible. It's never going to sell a copy and, and that's fine. I'm good with that. And then it makes 300 bucks. You're going to be like, oh, I made 300 bucks. Wow. It's the same 300 bucks in both stories, yeah. but one person is soul crushed and the other person is elated. So it's all about expectations. It's all about understanding that this industry is not a get rich quick scheme. It's not even a get rich if you work really hard scheme. It is a work really hard and only if you are lucky can you scrape out a living scheme. Like yeah. <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, that's not a great scheme. So most New York Times bestsellers make less money than somebody who manages a McDonald's. The average New York Times bestseller makes less than eighty thousand a year. Yeah. Wow. You can make more money <laughs> managing a McDonald's. <laughs> and that's the best of the best. That's the New York Times list. Yeah. Like those are the guys that are on top of the heap and they're still making <laughs> less money than a manager of McDonald's. Yeah. So you know, but the problem is that everybody just sees Stephen King and Rowling and Myers and they go, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be that person. Probably not. You know, most people who go to Hollywood do not become Tom Cruise. Yeah. <laughs> a 
<laughs> for some re- writers and and every actor that goes to Hollywood, every person who picks up a guitar, every person who can catch a football believes they're going to be the top of the top, and that's just a part of the you know all four of these are entertainment industries: acting, music, uh, right. sports, and writing. They're entertainment, and if you have the expectation that you're guaranteed to be one of the two or three people that actually make millions and millions of dollars, you're n- that's a wrong expectation. Uh, and, and the chances are so remote that you're going to hit that level that having the expectation is just going to crush you. Whereas if you go, you know what? I just love this. I love doing it. I'm going to try to eke out a living. I, I realize it's going to take me years. I realize I'm going to have to keep my day job. I realize my spouse is going to hate me because I'm chasing a dream that they don't understand. Yeah. Like you have, if you have these expectations, you understand it and you move forward with it and, and, and understand the difficulty of it, then I think it, it it means that you're going to be there for a lot longer because you're those those walls that you run into are not going to be you know death to you. Yeah. They're going to be. Yep, I expected that wall. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to figure out how to get around it or over it, and it's going to take me some yeah. time. And then once I do it, I'll keep going. Yeah. I'm going to run into another wall, and yeah. it's okay because you know I was expecting it. So that's why I spend a third of the book talking about you know mindset, expectations, the whole nine yards because I've never been in an industry. Where I mean, I will admit, I have never been as high emotionally as I have during the last ten years. I mean, the 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 peaks of my life, uh, you know, outside of obviously my wife and my children, mm-hmm. but from a business standpoint, because I've been working my whole life, from a business standpoint, I've never had such emotional highs, and I've also mm-hmm. never had such emotional lows. Yeah. I have never been down in the dirt deeper than <laughs> in the crap yeah. that this yes. industry has put me through. Yeah, yeah. But I knew it. I knew it going in. I knew it was going to be a tough ride. I knew it was going to be a hard, you know, path to follow. Uh, so I had that expectation that, oh, yeah, you're going to get your butt handed to you often and you're going to have to pick it back up and keep moving forward because what's the alternative? Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is the only I, I am psychic a little bit. I'm a little bit psychic. And so I do have one prediction that always comes true. One hundred percent of all writers who quit writing never become successful writers. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. I'm a little, a little psychic on that one. I think that's so true what you said about having having that staying power and that commitment. Appreciate, I appreciate your uh, talking about the, the mindset because that is so important, right? And, and often that helps us get through uh, and stay, you know, with reaching our goals, right? With writing and all right. that. So. Well, I had some of my team who were actually like 25,000 words on the mindset. You probably cut a lot of this out. I'm like, oh, I could. I'm not going to because I think it's very important. I really do believe yeah. that that first third of that book is is vital to yeah. you know the the career. If you're going to do this, then you know understanding how to set your expectations, understanding what you're going to be in for, understanding how hard this road really is. Because I'm not a cheerleader. Most a lot of writers who teach writing are cheerleaders, and I'm you know I'm not disparaging against them. This this is the way it is. Yeah. Um, you know, they get up there and they're like, you want to write? Awesome. It's so great. And like, but that's not why people come to me. People come to me because, I mean, brutal is in the title. And <laughs> I've actually had people come up to me where they're like, um, so you were a little kind of rude at some points in this. And I'm like, it's on the cover of the book. Like it literally says the word brutal in the cover or you know, on the cover of the book. How were you shocked that I was a little bit rude to you? Um <laughs> Because I mean that's yeah. the that's why I call it Drake's brutal writing advice yeah. because I'm not here to be a cheerleader I don't yeah. do the compliment sandwich I don't go well you do this really well you could really work on improving this but this you do excellently so I mean I have private uh, students uh, so if anybody's interested they can contact me for that but I'm not going to be your cheerleader I'm going to look at your writing and I'm going to show you the two or three things that are the the biggest mm-hmm. errors that you're making and try to make you a better writer and I'm going to be <laughs> I'm not going to be mean about it. I never attack the person. Yeah. But I'm definitely not going to be like, you know, rah, rah, shish, you, rah, you can do it. Anybody. No, screw you. You're going to you're going to pay attention and I'm going to tell you the way it is. <laughs> and I have definitely upset some people. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have rubbed people the wrong way that, you know, that send me stuff. Because the funniest thing is, and I can always tell because they send me stuff to, to have me review it or whatever. And I can tell they don't want to review. They want me to actually write them back and go, oh, my gosh. Oh, just this is this is this is breathtaking. Best best thing I've ever read. I could I couldn't edit or or touch this with a million. Like you are a god. That's what they want. Yeah. 
And if it actually was that way, like if you actually give me something like that, I will tell you. Uh, like one of the things that I've been touting about for the last two years, I've been keeping up with uh, newer fantasy books. So I'm talking books, fantasy books that have been published in the last three, five, six years. And I've gone through 84 of them now where I couldn't get past chapter five. 84 in a row that I bought and tried to read and couldn't get past chapter four or five and put it down. Uh, I was actually given a book accidentally. It was in a swag bag on a thing that I was a, a, a guest of. And so it just happened to be in there. And I'm like, mm. but I started, I've only read a page of it, but I went, my streak may be broken. Like, cause it was published last year by a medium press. So we're not even talking about, um, you know, something major, but I, all I did was read the first page the other night, right before I went to bed. Cause I had set it next to my nightstand. I was like, ah, let me, cause I figured that's why I put it there. Cause I figured I wouldn't get past page one. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, it's an easy thing for me to just eh, done. Um, and I read and I was like, okay, kid can write. Okay. Yeah. No, no. Liking this, liking this. So if it breaks my street, I will, I will throw it up, uh, throw it up and talk about it. But, um, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's, I need, I'm a fan and I want things to read. Yeah. And so, um, I do think that it starts with that mindset. Um, like, you know, you talk a lot about story and how to create, you know, um, just really great stories. So, um, uh, you talk about how a story is comprised of a series of events, but that the events that make up the plot are not the actual story. Would you talk about what you mean by that? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and I say that all the time, the events, and this always gets a rise out of the audience, but I say, <laughs> you know, the events of your story, your characters, your plot, your, um, your conflict, the whole nine yards is all worthless. It's absolutely worthless if you forget the one important thing, which yeah. is the invisible layer, it's the theme. Yeah. So I'm not saying that the physical layer, and the reason why I say it that way is to get a rise, but yeah. I'm not saying that the, the, the physical layer is unimportant. You have to have a, a spectacular physical layer. You have to have dynamic characters. You have to have an interesting mm -hmm. world. You have to have a, a dynamic conflict. Those are important, but it's the invisible layer. It's the theme. It's the message that fans walk away with. And so that what I always use, and I do pick on him, but he's got plenty of money for me to pick on, but I like to pick on Michael Bay for this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've all seen Michael Bay movies and I'm a huge fan of Michael Bay. He's gotten tons of my money. Like I've watched all his movies. I buy him on DVD. So it's not that, you know, I'm not a fan, but the reality is, is that he makes movies that are all about the visual appeal. They're about the explosions. They're about the big robots fighting other big robots and Transformers, whatever. No one ever walks into a Michael Bay um, movie expecting to get the story that we would get in a Shawshank Redemption. Like, yeah. it's just the way it is. But, but when we look at that from a professional, think about it. Think about when you go and see Transformers. Like, while you're watching it, you're like, wow, this is awesome. Look at that. That's funny. This is big, you know. But then 10 minutes later, it's done. And I'll, and I'll mention Transformers. And if you haven't seen Transformers in a year or two or three years, when I mention Transformers, you're like, eh. Like, I don't want to see it again. It was fine. I enjoyed it, but I'm not going to go back. But then you mention uh, Shawshank Redemption to somebody, and they're like, oh, my gosh. I haven't seen that in a decade. It was so amazing. I'm going to go look it up tonight. Why? Why is there, why is yeah. there a difference yeah. between – they're both great movies, and Michael Bay is a great movie producer. Why is there such a difference You know, after the fact, 10 years later, where everyone's like, oh, yeah, I enjoyed Transformers. It was fine. Yeah, I mean, if it's on, I'll watch it, but I'm not going to go out of my way to see it again versus Shawshank Redemption that – you know, people are still watching years and years, or the movie like the movie like Seven, um, yeah. like these movies that have these great themes and these great messages that that you just want to go back to time and mm -hmm. time and time again. Yeah. Um, and it's because of that invisible layer. It's because of the message. And here's the here's the cheat that I'm doing. You can get away with having a weaker invisible layer in visual medium. Mm -hmm. So Michael Bay can be so successful because you can have a story that people enjoy visually in the moment right now. Yeah. Prose is a different beast. You cannot have a prose, uh, long form prose story with no invisible message. You just can't. It's, and, and it's proven time and time and time again. This is not my opinion. Think about a book that you've read that the characters were fine. The writing was fine. The story seemed interesting, but at the end of it, you were like, meh. Like, yeah, yeah. they killed the dragon at the end. But so, yeah. and then you never think about it again. You don't think about that book a year from now. You don't, you know, somebody brings it up and you're like, I think I, I think I remember reading that. Um, I don't remember anything about it, 
But yeah, no, I've never read anything from that author ever again either. Um, I don't remember it being bad, but and that's because it has no invisible layer. It has no message. Yeah. The the stories that are going to impact the readers, what they're going to walk away with, what they're going to remember, is those that that theme, the invisible yeah. message. That's yeah. that's the only thing a reader can walk away with. So that's why I push that, and that's why I say, sure, you have to have this amazing you know physical layer. It's a part of the process, but the physical layer is only the delivery device. It's the UPS truck that delivers the invisible layer. Yeah. That's it, you know. Nothing else. So you kill the dragon at the end. If there's no rhyme or reason for it, if there's no message behind it, if it doesn't impact the the if it if it doesn't impact the why and the effect, and it's just a bunch of hows and whats, yeah, nobody cares. Yeah. Now this was interesting when you when you said this in your book. Uh, you said uh, the characters we write are extensions of the reader, and that's so true because you know I I feel that when I'm reading too, <laughs> and. Um, you know, so you, so you mentioned that when writers create a character, um, they're actually creating a shell for the reader to become. And I thought that was a great way to phrase that. Um, so what what is the essential quality that makes the difference in stories where the writer is excited to keep reading and where readers stop caring? So what is that essential difference then? So before I dig into that, I do want to take a step back. Yeah. Okay. Um, because it is important to kind of note two things and i've noticed this that i get in trouble with in my teachings uh <laughs> if, if these two things aren't explicitly stated first i teach speculative writing because i write speculative writing i am not a liter literary writer i don't write literary fiction yeah. which means i'll never win the big awards because only the literary people you know win that stuff i write genre fiction speculative fiction which means uh if you don't know the term speculative fiction or genre fiction it means that if you can put it on a bookshelf underneath yeah. a title in Barnes and Nobles, like mystery or romance or fantasy or zombie or horror or whatever, mm -hmm. those are you know speculative fiction. Uh, and the biggest difference is, and the reason why I write speculative fiction and not literary fiction is speculative fiction sells more copies. Speculative fiction is consumed yeah. by more people. Um, speculative fiction is the entertainment mecca of you know, publishing industry. So while literary people do poo poo on us and like, Oh, you just write that trite crap. That's just, you know, so terrible. You should, you should check out my stuff. My new book is, is written in future tense, first person plural. And everyone's name is Tom. And you don't even know who the narrator is or who is even talking. And it forces you to have to think constantly. And Oh, by the way, there's no plot and there's no theme. And, and I was like, yeah, no, that's, I'm not reading that. Thank you very much. Um, you have fun with that. I'm going to, uh, Eh, you know, I'm going to write dragons and people killing dragons and, you know, have that have my fun over here. So so that's one thing is, is that everything I teach and everything I talk about is definitely for the speculative fiction, you know, realm. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing is, is that everything I'm talking about are the, the norms. They're not the exceptions, because this happens to me all the time. Also, is that somebody comes up and says, well, you said this, this and this. But there's this one book that was very successful that absolutely breaks that complete rule. Yeah, it's called an exception. And if I was to teach every single exception, we would be here until we all died. Because that's <laughs> what exceptions are, is they're exceptions yeah. to the norm. Yeah. So you know, it's, it's important. So like talking about specific stuff like this, where I do believe that the reader or that the character is an extension of the reader is the norm. I mean, there are definitely popular products that make it that, that doesn't follow this uh, kind of thing. And, and really as the writer to come up with uh, those breakout books, you're going to have to break some of these norms. You're going to have to come up with an exception that nobody else has thought of. Uh, it's kind of funny because uh, since I study stories so much and since I consume so much, every time I see a bit of brilliance, it, it I always have this weird emotional thing that happens to me. Uh, when I first see it, I go, wow, look at that. That's amazing. They came up with something unique. And then I immediately go, ah, now I can never do that. <laughs> because it's already been done so it's 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 this weird kind of yay oh you know kind of moment for me yeah. but so just understand that so for me and and i do this with most of my characters and and this is the norm that i write in uh basically what i mean by that is whatever i want the reader to feel i just make the character feel it if i want the reader to be elated after a certain scene or something like that i make sure that the scene takes the character to a to an elevated level emotionally mm -hmm. if i want the reader to be depressed i just make sure i do something to that main character that is going to destroy them or whatever so so you know a lot of people struggle and the reason why i came up with that that theory was a lot of my students were having trouble um, 
understanding how to make readers feel things. They were like, well, I don't understand how it's simple. You just make the character feel it. Because if I, if you've done your job and you've mm -hmm. built that visceral connection between the reader and the character. Yeah. So if you love Harry Potter, yeah. then whatever Harry Potter feels, you're going to feel yeah. it's, it's going to transpose onto you. And so that's what I mean by that. And that's, that's why I think that's a good way to kind of wrap your mind around. Cause, cause what is, what is a story about? Is, is, is Harry Potter about, making Harry Potter feel these things? No, yeah. Harry Potter no. is worthless. Yeah. <laughs> it's about making the reader feel something yes. because that's what we do. Remember, we're writing for them, not for our characters, yes. not for, if, if nobody reads that story, it's sort of like if a tree falls in the woods and no one's around <laughs> to hear it. So if you write a story and no one reads it, yeah, exactly. it doesn't matter. <laughs> Because no one reads it and those characters are not real and there is not a mag magical land that's created that becomes its own world as, you know, off of your imagination. Uh, if it isn't read, it isn't real. Yeah. So that's what I mean by that is, is that you, you start to understand that you can manipulate your readers constantly by just understanding what you're doing with your characters. So, uh, again, a lot of people... And, and professional writers do this too. I just don't. So I'm not saying that this isn't a way to do it. But a lot of people are like, oh, no, the characters do whatever they want. And they're, you know, they're, they're in charge. And like, no, 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 no. I'm the writer. I'm in charge. And I'm going to make sure that, that I'm manipulating my reader exactly the way. So when I want you to feel happy, you're going to feel happy. And when I want you to feel sad, you're yeah. going to feel sad. When I want you terrified, you're going to be terrified. And I'm going to do that by manipulating my characters and the events and the story and everything like that. So that's what I mean by that. Okay, so this is, I was reading this in your book too. Um, now this goes right along with what we we're just talking about, but um, so how can writers understand the reader's subconscious expectations? Um, like what are the invisible elements that are missing, say when a reader is unhappy and wants to throw the book across the room? It, it comes down to two things. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, whatever genre you're writing in, you have to understand that there are uh, expectations. Right. And these, these are probably unknown, but they are expectations. And the, and the easiest one to, to kind of just flaunt in your face is if you're going to write murder mysteries, you have to uh, have a murder. It's kind <laughs> of it's, – it's expected that there will be a murder in a murder mystery. So, you know, these are the expectations. These are the obligatory scenes, uh, yeah. uh, as Cohen likes to call them. Um, so these are things that, that we need to know as, as a genre writer. You need to know what your, you know, the, the required things are for your genre. So, like, I've had people that, uh, that read my stuff and they're like, oh, how trite. You have a main character who can use a sword. I'm like, it's fantasy. Like, that's kind of the point. You know, it's got, oh, you have magic in your world. You know, could you be a little bit more creative? I'm like, magic is what defines the fantasy industry. Like, no, I would write I would be writing in a different genre if I didn't have the magic. Yeah. So like you have to understand that. You have to understand what your genre is. You have to understand what what your what your readers are gonna come into. Um, so that's that's kind of step one or one half of that answer. And one of the beautiful things about that is you can you can also play with those mm -hmm. so um so you can you once you understand your genre really really well it's the reason why you need to be the center of your of your what you're writing you need to be in the center of the fan base of, of what you write because you need to read this stuff and consume this stuff constantly so that you understand what people are going to expect and then you can play with that uh so like i had a book that came out um where i played with the trope of uh, one of the things that kills me in fantasy is where you have two brothers and one becomes a hero and so the other becomes the villain because he's jealous. And I'm like, yeah. really? Does that ever happen? Does anybody become a doctor so the other guy becomes a bank robber because he's pissed off that his brother's a doctor? <laughs> like, I don't think that has ever happened in the history no. of ever. So that's a stupid trope. And so I played with that in this. And so I made, I, I made it. I made it feel like I was going that direction, which gave a comfortability to the story to the readers because they're like, ah, oh, see where this is going. Yeah. And then I can take that left turn at Albuquerque. I can go. Oh, that's nope, great. Fooled you. Yeah. Um, 
and and but you got to understand these these scenes these these required scenes what what is what is needed uh, or what is expected you know they're they're coming in to my fantasy book as fantasy readers so they're going to expect specific things at all times yeah. and so when you really understand those you can really start messing with them and you can come up with these exceptions as I was talking about that that take these tropes and kind of turn them upside down uh, in the Hitman's Bodyguard I'll ruin a small piece of that uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it but one of the things that i loved is we have the two characters yeah. and and you know the ryan reynolds character is obviously the hero and he's just he's good and like he doesn't even like even in fighting uh people uh he never kills he always beats them up and ties them up or whatever so when he gets hooked up with the jackson character who's just shooting everybody in the face he gets mad he's like yeah. stop it like we don't <laughs> have to kill these guys they yeah. have moms and sisters and yeah. maybe children and like stop shooting people in the face so I th it was really cool, and so it really showed how much of a hero he was. Yeah, and 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 they never made the Jackson character out to be a bad guy. It was obvious that he was a, an antihero. He was the Deadpool kind of antihero esque type thing. But what was so beautiful? There's this beautiful scene where they have a heart to heart discussion, and Ryan Reynolds realizes he's not the hero. Yeah, he's actually he's a good guy. Yeah, but he's on the wrong side. And he, he realizes it. Like, he actually realizes, holy crap, you're the hero. I'm not, I'm the villain. And so it was this awesome, beautiful moment. And they don't even really, it's very understated. It's just this, I really wish they would have, they could have played with it uh, for 30 or 40 more seconds and really beefed it up. Yeah. But uh, it was this beautiful moment. And so doing stuff like that where you take these these expectations and and flip them on their heads are just brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and then the other side of that is understanding what we've already talked about, that, that a story, especially prose, is mm -hmm. about the theme. It's about understanding that you're delivering a message. And if you don't deliver a message, then um, you have no story. And yeah. so that's the hard part for a lot of aspiring writers, because most people don't even understand what a theme is. That's one of the things I think I'm most proud of, of uh, dynamic story creation is, is all the reviews that say, this is the only book that's ever explained theme to me. Yeah. This is it. I mean, I went to college for writing, and this is it. This is the first time I understood <laughs> themes. Yeah. Would, I'm you very, talk, very would you talk proud. about that? The, what yeah. a theme is? And, and yeah. Go so, into that? Um, so a theme is is the story. Uh, a theme in a story is its underlying message. Yeah. Um, it, it's its big idea. In yeah. other words, what critical belief or idea about life are you trying to convey to the reader? Yeah. This belief idea um, has to transcend cultural barriers. That's the yeah. big thing about themes. They they're the only um, requirement to yeah. understanding a theme is that the reader was born human. So greed. No matter what sex you are, no matter what race you are, no yeah. matter what culture you're from, no matter what religion you are, you get that greed is a bad thing. So that's the thing. And 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 what you start to learn is that um, themes are limited. You know, one of the things that kills a lot of writers, and I've met them, that come to my class and like, yeah, you know, I went and got my MFA in creative writing. And as soon as I graduated, I was like, I will never write because I learned that there's only a handful of stories. That's it. And every single story is the same story told over and over and over and over again. And once I learned that, I was just, I was soul crushed and I'm done. I'm out. I'm, I'm like, as an artist, understanding that every story is the same means I'm not going to try to do it. And I was like, well, that's one way to look at it because you are right. Every story is the same. Every story, there's a handful of stories and that's it. That's all you get. Yeah. That's the skill. The skill side is learning those handful of stories, and that's all you get. And and I know people are out there right now. They're thinking to themselves, "Ooh, so all I got to do is invent a new type of story?" No, you <laughs> cannot. You will. So this is this is my answer to that. So everybody knows that I'm a chef, and I'm like, "Hey, come on over. I'm gonna I'm gonna cook you a dinner. And it's gonna be awesome." And you're like, "Hey, I've heard great things about your cooking. Yeah, let's do this. What are you making?" And I go. It's a new type of meat I invented. It's not beef. It's not chicken. It's not cow. It's a brand new type of meat <laughs> that I invented. You're going to love it. You're going to be like, oh, man, it's Saturday night? No, I forgot I had a thing on Saturday night. Not going to be able to make your dinner with your invented meat. <laughs> like that's the reality of it. You cannot – if you invent a new story that's never yeah. been done before, nobody's going to understand it. Nobody's going to get it. You're not delivering those – you're not fulfilling those unknown expectations. We've been telling stories for over 5,000 – written stories for over 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. um, 
the story of Gilgamesh is the oldest uh, written story that we have, and that was around 3000 BC that it was written on these on these 12 clay tablets. Yeah. Um, obviously, we've been telling stories way longer than that, but in the oral tradition, but written 5,000 yeah. years. Wow. You're not smarter than every human that has been born over the last <laughs> 5,000 years. You're not. Sorry to break it to you. I know your mother says you are, but you're, she's wrong. Uh, so, like, that's... Sorry, that's me getting a little brutal. Um, <laughs> That's that's the thing is you have to to embrace that you have to understand and, and when it comes to themes and I don't know how many there are I've never counted there's a few hundred two three four hundred in the book I list off a hundred just off the top of my head there might be three or four hundred themes but 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 it is limited you are limited to the number of themes because it has to be that it has to transcend like you can't write a theme about how mustard is is evil because that's not. That doesn't transcend cultural barriers. That, that isn't a human thing to yeah. understand. Now, me personally, I believe that. There's no mustard in my house. No one's allowed to bring mustard. So when I have a cookout, don't bring mustard because I will kick you out of my house because it is evil. But I'm pretty much the only one probably on the planet that believes that. So it's not a universal theme. Yeah. So that's what you start to understand is that, that themes are about that. I think the the hardest thing to grasp as a professional story creator is to understand how that theme is delivered. So the theme is delivered through transport uh, transformation, um, but really skipping over the transformation side and, and skipping all the way to the end. Um, what people don't understand about stories is that the climax of your story mm -hmm. has to be overcome by answering the theme. So you have a theme that's a question. Yeah. Uh, whatever it is, which means any question is going to have two answers. It's going to have two sides to it. Right. Um, so like uh, Star Wars A New Hope, and I love yeah. using this as an example. The theme of Star Wars A New Hope, the first movie, is very simple. Should we re rely on technology to save us or should we rely on faith to save us? Now, I know it's it's in the movie, it's the force, but the force is an allegory. An allegory is something that means something else. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the force is an allegory for religion because you can't talk about religion. You can't talk about higher powers and all this other stuff. So as a writer, um, you know, Lucas came up with the force to be that allegory. Yeah. But that's really the decision. And I know this is the major theme because at the very end of it, what's the overcome? We have to blow up the Death Star. Well, blowing up the Death Star doesn't mean blowing up the Death Star. It's not shooting a missile into it and blowing it up. It's answering the question, should I rely on technology to save me or should I rely on faith to save me? Yeah. And at the end, when he's in the trench, after Han Solo saves him, the rescue from without, shoots Darth Vader in the butt and he goes off on his way. Luke has to answer that question. He has to answer, do I use my targeting computer, which everyone else has missed with and has you know, completely failed us constantly mm -hmm. this entire time, or do I turn it off and believe in something greater than myself? Mm -hmm. And when he answers that question, only then can that question be used to overcome blowing up the Death Star. So it isn't a missile that blows up the Death Star. It's Luke actually deciding that he needs to buy into one side of the theme. And we know this is a theme because throughout the entire show, there's been scenes that have proved that you should rely on technology. Then there's been another scene that proves you should rely on right. faith. Then yeah. there's another one that, right. that, and so we're bouncing back and forth. And these are called reversals. And we're reversing the story between it. And this is the transformation. And so Luke has to struggle with this back and forth, back and mm -hmm. forth, until we get to the climax where now you have to decide. You have have lived this with me. You've you've been you back and forth. But now the pavement meets the road. Yeah. Or the rubber meets the pavement. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Are you going to do faith? Are you going to do technology? Are you going to do faith? What are you going to do, Luke? Make a decision because yeah. this is it. You got to do it. Yeah. And so we know this. So, so same thing with Finding Nemo. The, now there's two main stories. So there's two major themes. Mm -hmm. But let's just look at the Marlin story because that's the majority of it. That's the daddy fish. So it, the, the theme that he has to struggle with is – is it better to be an overprotective parent that, that raises your child, protecting them from everything? Or is it better to raise children knowing that eventually they're going to have to make their own decisions? That's the decision. And so, again, we go through the story and there's scenes that prove, no, you should be overprotective. No, you should actually teach them to stand on the No, you should be overprotective. So we're, we're constantly yeah. battling between it. But at the end, for the overcome, Dory's going to die. The only person to save Dory is, is Nemo. So now, Marlin, you have to answer the theme. Do you become an overprotective parent and make sure that nothing can happen to your child, but you know that that means Dory dies? 
or do you go the other way and believe that you have raised this child to stand on their own two feet and make their own decisions and let them become more of a, a, an adult in the society. So which do you choose because we can't finish this story? And that's, I think, the hardest thing for people to grasp. And that's the, the, the missing piece that they don't teach yeah. in schools is, you know, they say, oh, you got to have a theme. And you're like, uh, oh, okay, what, what do I do with it? Well, you have to have one. That's what you do with it. You put it in your story. And you're like, but it's like one of my biggest things, and I don't admit this often, but I'm dyslexic. Uh, yeah. You won't get that from reading me, but I am dyslexic, and I yeah. and I've always struggled with this. And it, I, I, I literally would have been the kid that would come into school and shoot all the teachers uh, if if that was a thing back in in the seventies. We didn't have that that whole thing, but um, I, it it really frustrated me because I would say, "How do you spell blah?" And the the teacher would go, "Well, just look it up in the dictionary." Like I can't even put the alphabet in order. How do I look something up in a dictionary? I don't know what even goes after the letter D. Yeah. Like it makes no sense to me. Yeah. So, you know, that's the thing about theme and 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 how most of the academic world teaches it. They just go, Well, you gotta have it. Like, what do I do with it? Well, you just have it. That's what you do. Put it in your story. And that's crazy because it doesn't make any sense. So that's why, you know, I break it down a little bit deeper and and say, look, this is what we're doing with this. And this is what we have to accomplish. And so so that's really it. You come up with your theme. You figure out what the theme of the story is. And then once you figure that out, now you have to figure out how that theme overcomes the conflict. Uh, And what we were talking about were internal themes. There's Mm -hmm. another type of story called an external theme, which are more esoteric. So like Lord of the Flies is an uh, an external one, which means the characters aren't characters. Ralph is not a character and and Jack is not a character. Ralph is an allegory for all humans are good and Jack is an allegory for all humans are evil. They're not real people. So there's no internal story. They're not like like Luke Skywalker or or Marlin having to, to struggle with an answer. He is the answer. Ralph is the answer that all humans are good and Jack is the answer. But we still come to that conflict point, that that over that we have to do, and we still have to answer it. So that's the scene where Piggy dies. So Piggy is killed accidentally, Mm -hmm. but he's killed, and everybody stops. The world stops because it's an external answer. So it's the world that has to make the choice, not an individual character. So the world freezes and goes, we just killed Piggy. What do do we do? I think that's his name, right? I'm doing that right. I think his name was Piggy. Anyway. Yeah. so now the world has to decide. They could decide, oh, crap, we can't continue doing this. We, we, we just killed somebody. We've got to stop, yeah. which means they're going to answer the thing, all humans are innately good. Yeah. Or they have to go, yeah, he was annoying anyway. Matter of fact, Ralph, you're annoying too. We're going to kill you too, which means they prove that all humans are evil. So yeah. it could go either way. Yeah. He, you know, Golding went the way of all humans are evil because he truly believed that. And that's what he was trying to prove in the book, that we're all evil at our core. Um, a philosophy I disagree with. I think that all humans are basically good inside. And maybe I'm living in my own fantasy world, which is pretty much how I live my life anyway. So, um, you know, that's what we have to figure out. And that's the hard thing. So once you figure out your theme, it's that's not enough. To deliver that theme, whatever is when you kill that dragon at the end, that dragon is not killed by the guy wielding the sword. That dragon is killed by the guy wielding the sword answering and picking which side of the theme he's going to go with. And that is what kills the dragon. Yeah, he uses the sword and again, physical layer. Yeah. But it's the answering of the theme that kills the dragon, yeah. not the big dude with the sword. What I try to do in all these, and the reason why I break it down in such a blue-collar, layman's kind of way, is to show you that, yeah, these are high-end, very complex topics. But if I can teach it to you in a way that you can grasp, I mean, anybody can wrap their head around what I just said about the theme. So, you know, if I can break it down to you like that and show you examples and show you how you can apply it to your own writing, hopefully you can then go, hmm, okay, let me take a deeper look at this. Let me see if I can I can apply this in what I'm doing. And then hopefully you can actually start making money in this industry. <laughs> Having people give you five-star you know, reviews and all yeah. that other stuff. Because yeah. it's still, whether you get an MFA in creative writing or not, it's regardless. You still have to know the same stuff. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to go to six years of college. Yeah. But you got to know everything that you would have learned had you gone to six years of college. Unfortunately, not going to college means it's going to take you 10, 12, 15 years to learn it as opposed to being force-fed it for six years. But you yeah. still have to have the same knowledge you you have to get it and that's why i keep saying time effort time effort to be a professional writer it's time 
an effort, but I believe you have to push yourself and really yeah. understand this, the story structure and story theory and grammar and all this stuff because you expect people to give you money for this. Uh, so, you know, in, in your book, you encourage writers to take that extra step of um, creating the two opposing uh, layers. And I, I'm not sure if, is that what you called the reversal? before um, well that's the two sides of a theme so yeah, okay what, where you're going is uh the even me i don't i don't work well with a question so um okay. so with like star wars a new hope yeah. i'm not going to write a book that that is that is should you rely on technology or faith like yeah. that doesn't mean anything for that's that's for the for the reader to, to answer that's that's their question right. so what i would rather do it helps me to wrap my mind around it when I go ahead and turn those into two opposing answers. So what I do is you should rely on technology to save you because it's the only thing that will save you. Yeah. And then I also have the answer, you should rely on something greater than yourself because it's the only thing that will save you. Yeah. And the reason why I do that is, is because then I can actually look at end every individual scene that I'm writing on that yeah. physical layer. And I can go, all right, scene number one, do you prove one of the two of these? Do you prove technology or do you prove faith? And if the answer is yes, I prove one of those two things, then that scene stays. If I look at the scene and I go, do you prove one of these two things? And it goes, I, I don't have anything to do with that. Then that scene's cut. Yeah. Because it doesn't have anything to okay. do with your theme. Right. It, you're not writing a tight story. Mm -hmm. uh, now, every time when I say that, I will usually get a question. It's like, well, well, what if there's things in that chapter that, that I need for the story? Great. You have two. There's two ways to fix that. Either one, figure out how to get that scene to, to prove one of those answers right. is true. Yeah. Or take out the elements that are, you know, that are plot devices that need to be in the story and put them in other scenes. Like it's not that difficult, yeah. but if a scene doesn't, if it isn't proving one two of the two sides as true, then the scene is bloat. It's it's fluff. It does not need to be in the chapter or in the book, and it's going to cause readers. It's going to cause confusion. They're not going to understand the, the message. Um, you know, and again, we've all reached the end of a book or a yeah. movie where we're just like, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. And it, and it's that thing. It's it's that that. You know, we didn't answer any question. There's nothing that I'm contemplating. There's nothing that's forcing me to have to to readdress, you know, the 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 thoughts that are in my head and where I thought we were going or anything like that. So you have to write tight. Uh, you know, your story has to be a tight story, and every scene must prove one side or the other is true. And if it doesn't, then it's fluff. Yeah. You got to cut. Yeah. So that's why I like coming up with those two opposing answers as opposed to a question because a question is not good enough for me as the writer. It's great for the reader, but for me yeah. as the writer, I need those answers to, to stay focused mm -hmm. scene after scene after scene after scene and make sure that every scene is needed. Um, I just, I noticed as I was reading your book that, and then I was thinking, you know, obviously I was thinking of the own story, my own stories that I'm writing, but I was thinking, you know, I'm not going maybe as deep as I should be with these themes and you know making sure that everything is is lined up and so that's why i need to reread your book but <laughs> it's the number one thing that said after every one of my classes is man thank you so much that was a huge amount of information i now have to rewrite everything i've ever written <laughs> <laughs> well there you go so that's a compliment <laughs> hard to do but you know <laughs> and it feeds my uh, sadistic nature because I love torturing people. So <laughs> it's just, it, it's awesome for me. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> That's great. You share, you share in your book that um, in simple terms to understand the soul of story creation is pick your theme, flesh it out. Think about how it'll affect the scenes you're about to write. And then write your scenes um, with your theme at, on, the t on the top of your mind, right? And um, you share in your, in your book a step-by-step -step guide that will help fiction writers gather the information they need to begin creating their stories. Would you, would you share those steps? And then uh, I think you mentioned that readers can find a PDF version on your website. Yeah. So I'm not 100% sure it's up yet is, is basically oh, okay. my point. Yeah. Um, but but it, 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 and it's way too complicated to talk about over here because I get into this matrix of story structure and okay. like I, I, even in live classes I struggle with trying to teach it um, because there's a complexity to stories especially if they're an internal story arc versus an external story arc yeah. so like just to, to give you a taste of it as an internal story arc um, what I talk about is that the physical layer and the invisible layer do not line up 
which means we have a, phys a physical layer. Uh, let's mm -hmm. look at New Hope, just the Star Wars New Hope. Yeah. So the physical layer, we have a conflict. We have the rebels versus the empire. But we also have an invisible layer that has a conflict, which means we have technology versus faith. Yeah. And so they don't line up. And what I mean by that is, is that um, Luke has to decide technology or faith. That's the answer that he's trying to give. And so he's got to rely on the physical layer to give him clues. Well, on the good side, we have Obi-Wan Kenobi, who's all like, dude, faith, faith, faith. That's all you have, the force. That's all you need. And so that makes it really easy for Luke to go, oh, I should choose faith. But also on the good side, we have Han Solo, who's like, <laughs> hokey religions? No, no, nothing beats a good blaster, kid. You know, so now we have a good guy going, uh, technology. So Luke has a hard time. And then on the other side, we have Darth Vader, who's like, faith. Yeah, yep, nope, force. That's all we need. So now Luke is like, well, wait a minute now. I shouldn't choose it because of that. But also we have, you know, the general and, um, you know, the Death Star and all this stuff saying technology. You want to rule the galaxy? Technology. And there's even, it's so in your face. When you start studying story structure and you start understanding what these people are doing, there's a scene on the bad side that everybody quotes, but it literally is Lucas flaunting in your face that there are two opposing sides. And, and there's two scenes. So on the good side, we have the scene where we're in the Millennium Falcon yeah. and Obi-Wan is teaching Luke how to do it. And he's got the blindfold on and he's fighting it and literally you have the two opposing factions that are in there and that's where that line comes from you know hokey religions are no uh substitute for a good blaster at your side so yeah. in the good side we have both of the theme uh questions warring with each other and yeah. then he repeats it with the bad guys when and that's the scene where darth vader chokes the guy yeah. and there's that scene where darth vader's like you know, you have no idea the power of the dark side, you know, because the, the guy says, look, once this Death Star comes online, once technology is here, no one will be able to oppose us. And yet Darth Vader's like, no, no technology, no faith. So, like, it's so brilliant that yeah. we have this matrix going on and it makes it so difficult for Luke to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And you wonder why um, the you know, Star Wars became the number one money making yeah. <laughs> uh, IP in the history of IPs. And it's because of how brilliantly Lucas was at, at understanding the hero's journey. Yeah. He had just come out of class with uh, Joseph Campbell. So he basically just wrote a movie script exactly the way his professor told him to write it. It's why I use Star Wars A New Hope when I'm teaching the hero's journey because it follows it to the T. Yeah. Uh, which is another reason, again, that, that moment of, yay, you did it perfectly. You followed it. Oh, but now I can't follow it perfectly to the T. So, like, <laughs> because it's already been done. So that's the complexity and, and that's when you start really understanding, you know, how to, to mess with the physical layer and how it uh, delivers that invisible layer, you start seeing the code behind the story. I love to talk about like the matrix. So it's like when uh, Cypher was sitting in the chair and Neo walks in and you got the screens with all the code that's running down and Cypher says, yeah, I don't even see the code anymore. I just see a blonde and a redhead and a brunette. Um, I'm the reverse. I sit in the chair and I don't see the blonde or the brunette or the redhead. I just see the code. Yeah. So I watch stories and I just see, you know, the code as it's coming across the movie screen to me. Yeah. And I think that's that that's what helps me teach it. And it also helps me uh, write such dynamic stories and, and make them more interesting to my fan base. And yeah. I usually, I mean, my first stuff published 10 years ago was running four out of five, but everything that's been published, like all the Sony stuff that came out and there wasn't a lot, you know, a lot of it, but there was some that was uh, released because they were using me as kind of a marketing platform. Uh, we're talking tie-in fiction and it's all running 4.8, 4.9 out of five stars. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, my first review of that was my favorite. It was a professional review and it said, all right, the first EverQuest next uh, story has hit the, 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 internet and as we all know no one reads tie-in fiction for the story we read it to learn about the game and he said i have no idea where they got this guy from but holy crap you need to read this this was an amazing story and so i was very very proud of you know here's yeah. a jaded um reviewer of gaming you know literature and gaming literature is not necessarily known for its story value yeah um <laughs> You know, there are, I mean, Timothy Zahn is an amazing writer. I love Zahn stuff. There, there's Stackpole is a great writer. Like there are, um, you know, Salvatore, obviously, Ed Greenwood I've already mentioned. There are some amazing um, uh, writers in the uh, in the realm of uh, tie-in fiction. Yeah. But it's just not known for being liter literature heavy yeah. uh, or story heavy. It's because it's, you know, it, it is what it is. It's a tie-in for a game and it's really about marketing the game. 
you know, that was a discussion that I had to have within uh, within the ranks of Sony. It was like, look, you know, you, you hired me because you like me as a writer. I'm going to write. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to do tie in. You know, I'm not going to do your normal stuff, which means like one of the big problems with tie in is is time. Yeah. They don't give writers very much time to produce that stuff. It's a corporation. They're like, no, no, no. You got yeah. three weeks to write 20,000 words yeah. and, and it, it'll be published. And that was one of the first meetings. I was like, so I'm going to take my time. I'm going to take as long as it takes to get you stuff. And you're not going to bitch about that. Um, so, you know. It, it just I was in a position where I could demand uh, a little bit more out of them so I could take the time to create because it takes time. You know, Michael yeah. Crichton is one of my favorite authors, a guy who wrote Jurassic Park. And um, one of his favorite sayings that has resonated with me my entire life is books aren't written. They're rewritten. Yeah. And I truly believe that. I truly believe that the genius, mm -hmm. the, the truly compelling, amazing stuff that uh, that that you read in books did not come out in the first draft. Yeah, uh, you know, it it came out in that sixth, seventh, eighth draft that that multiple times through. Like like people meet me outside of the industry, uh, like at a grocery store or whatever, and they'll find out that I'm a writer, and they'll go, "Oh, that must be an amazing job." I'm like, "Oh, it's fantastic." If you can stomach reading the same book six hours a day, five days a week for nine months, it's awesome. <laughs> And they're like, I, I don't think I'd want to do that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, it's tough. <laughs> it's not it's not pleasant. And so that's yeah. why it pisses me off when I meet, you know, some people in the self-publishing world. They're like, oh, I would never do that. I write it. My writer's group gives me a few comments and then I publish it. I'm like, oh, because that's not where the brilliance comes from, um, in my opinion, and definitely for my writing. You know, maybe they are smarter than me. There's a lot of people in this world smarter than me. So maybe they're one of those many, many people that are smarter than me. But for me and for Michael Crichton and for, you know, everyone else that's a professional in this game that I talk to, it th those brilliant moments, those amazing things that, that the readers go, oh, I can't believe you did that. Yeah, that didn't happen in the, uh, in the original draft. Yeah. It happened in the rewrite. Yeah. So it's, it's a part of that. It's a part of the process of getting there. Yeah. So just as we kind of, uh, sort of come to the end of, of our chat. There's many new newer writers that are of fiction that are listening. Would you would you talk about what your you know top three tips would be uh, for writers who are kind of just getting started telling stories and well, and nobody wants to hear this. Um, my favorite quote from David Eddings was uh, you know he talks about the ten uh, ten thousand hour thing. He says you know what I tell the new writer is write a million words, yeah. pour your soul into them, edit the tar out of them. And then throw them away. And <laughs> after that, you're ready to start writing the first word that is publishable. Yeah. And and he's not the only one said it. Terry Brooks said it. Um, Ray Bradbury said it. Heinlein said it. King said it. I've said. It. I mean, th this the million words because it takes about ten thousand hours to write a million words. Um, but nobody wants to hear that. And and the other thing is, I say a million words all the time, and and the audience is like, oh yeah, a million words. But then I break it down a little step further. Understand what that means. A million words is ten hundred thousand word novels. Yeah. So what we're, what all of us are saying is write ten novels yeah. and throw them in the garbage. Yeah. <laughs> then you can write your eleventh novel and try to sell it. And people hear that and they're like, No, no, I'm I'm doing my first book and it's awesome. My mom loves it. Like it's the best thing. And no, it isn't. I'm sorry, it's not. Um, and I promise you, it's not. And the 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 litmus test, because I, when I say that, everyone's like, oh, you're just being a jerk. Here's the litmus test that every writer can do in the privacy of their own home to prove what I just said is fact. Go back and read something you wrote six months ago or a year ago. Yeah. Is it good? Because if it's not, and it shouldn't be, and you better hope it's not. Because if it's not, that means that you've improved. Yeah. The weird thing about being a writer is that um, until you reach a very, very high level, as you're coming up through it, and, and, and also there's, there's a bottom that this doesn't apply to, and there's a top that this doesn't apply to, but the most of the people who are trying to be, uh, you know, they call themselves aspiring writers and are, are going to writers groups and all that, they fit into this category. And it's a real, really weird aspect, but I've noticed this for decades that this happens. Writers can only see other writing that's below them. So in other words, they get into the writer's groups and they can see, oh, well, you head hop or you author intrude or you, you know, mix the tenses of your participles or whatever. They can see that stuff. Yeah. They, ha they do not have the ability to see above them. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they read like a Brandon Sanderson and go, I'm just as good as him. You're yeah. not. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's because you can't see the difference. You can't see that he's actually like, and I'll keep going down. Uh, he's way up here yeah. and you're not. Yeah. You can see the guy that's right below you, but that's, that's where your vision stops. Mm -hmm. You can no longer see why Sanderson is so much better than you. You think you're the same. And the litmus test, again, to prove this is to go back and reread something you wrote a year ago. If you're really in the industry and you're really studying and you're really going to writers groups and you're really trying to improve as a writer, then anything you read six months ago or wrote six months ago or a year ago, you're going to reread it and go, what the crap was I thinking? This is terrible. because it's below you now. So you yeah. can see it. Yeah. But you can't see above you. So so nobody wants to hear it. Everybody's like, oh, no, my first book is in. But here's the danger of that. Reviews stay on the internet forever. So if you self-publish a book under mm -hmm. the name you want to write under, which is a brand, just like McDonald's and Coke, and it gets a bunch of one-star, two-star reviews, they're there forever. Sure, you can take the book off sale, but the reviews are going to stay there. Mm -hmm. So you may have just destroyed your brand, and you may have to rebrand yourself with a whole new name, which means you're starting all over. So the, the three things, though, to, to get onto them. First is study. You've got to okay. study this stuff. You have to study story structure. You have to study story theory. You have to study themes. You have to study grammar. When I, I just said the word, you're mixing your tenses on your participles. If that sounds like I started speaking a foreign language to you, then you need to look up those terms, like Google them right now, yeah. because you need to know this stuff. You need to know what this stuff is to, to play in the professional game. The second thing is practice. You know, I say it takes 10 years to do this. It doesn't take 10 years to learn grammar. It doesn't take 10 years to learn story theory and story structure. It takes a couple of years. That's not good enough. It's not the end of the game. Understanding grammar doesn't mean you can apply it. The reason why it takes 10 years and the reason why you have to write those million words is what you have to get to the level of is you have to get to the level where you're writing without thinking about it. You have to, it has to become muscle yeah. memory. I don't think about tenses. I don't think about participles. I don't think about sentence structure. I don't think about, you know, story structure. I don't think about this stuff when I'm writing because I've been doing it for 30 years. I, it's, it's, it's muscle memory to me now. So I can now write at a very high, you know, professional level that, um, that other people might still be struggling at. Yeah. So that's the thing. It's practice. You have to spend the time. And if 10 years sounds too long to you, think about it like this. Stephen King, the most prolific writer of our generation, did beat the 10-year curve. He did it in only eight years. So okay. he beat it by 20%. Are you the most prolific writer in the history of the human race? If you are, maybe you can do it in only eight years. If you're not the most prolific writer of our generation, it may take you 10 or even 12. Like That's the reality of this. So yeah. think about I mean, Put yourself in reality. Stop having these you know, fictitious expectations that you're going to puke words on the page and make a million dollars. Does it happen? Yes. And I'm not going to mention any you know, to pick on them, but Fifty Shades of Grey. It does happen. You know, so there are you know, things. But people win the lottery every year, too. Are you going to win the lottery this year? Probably not. And do you, would you live your life knowing that you're going to win the lottery? No, that would be an insane way to live. So study and practice are the yeah. two things. And then to, to circle back around to the very beginning of this, the third thing is tenacity, yeah. is, is understanding that this is a long, uh, long game. It's not a short game. You, you have to come into it thinking in the 10-year term. You have to come into it thinking. And maybe you do beat it. Maybe you do get it in eight years. I mean, the digital age has changed things. People are getting successful quicker with fewer books. Not that those books are any good, but they're finding a home. They're finding a readership. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the, the flip side to everything that I say, because I, I talk about how you should push yourself in grammar and all that. The flip side is, is that the fan mentality like there's a reason why Fifty Shades of Grey is successful because it deserves to be not because of its writing quality in any way, shape or form, but it does absolutely deserve to be a multi-million copy selling book because it found its audience and its audience doesn't care about the quality of the writing. Yeah. So so it does deserve, you know, I like picking on it, but she makes more money than me so she can afford for me to pick on her. Um, <laughs> it still deserves to be the success that it is because it found its audience. So we are in the digital age. We are in a much faster um, to market age mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So maybe you can beat that 10 year mark. Maybe that 10 year mark is, is unrealistic in today's world, but it's still going to be years. It's not going to happen with your first book. It's, you know, it's not going to happen in the next two or three years. You know, if you are going to hit it, you're going to hit it in five, six, seven years. Maybe if you're one of the very few lucky ones, 
but you have to have that right expectation. You have to have that long game mentality or you're going to hit that first wall and you're going to quit and yeah. they're out and I don't have to compete with you ever again. So it's it really those are the three things study practice tenacity yeah no that's really good well thanks so much drake for you know sharing your great advice today and uh um so for many two great hour, tips two hour <laughs> long interview yeah no it's it's great it's great uh there's so many great tips uh you know on writing stories and understanding theme um people will have to re-listen to really get it and uh, so would, would you share what books, projects you have on the go right now and then where readers and writers can find you and your books online? Yeah. Well, if you want to see if I'm just an arrogant fool or if I can actually have some chops, there's a ton of free stuff on my website. Uh, some of the Sony stuff, since that was canceled, uh, I've thrown up on, on uh, my website. Um, I'm in rebuild mode on my fiction side because I did the three and a half years with Sony. Before that, I got hired to write some musicals that never got produced. Um, I've actually written a couple movie scripts that didn't get produced. So the last five years, I've been paid to write, but unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of stuff that has come out. Uh, so I am in rebuild mode on the fiction side. Uh, I'm in negotiations with uh, a couple big publishers right now on a five book series. So we'll see where that goes. But um, but the nonfiction is is what I've been kind of pushing and touting. All available on Amazon. You get physical copies. You can get it on Kindle. If you're a Prime member, it is free on Prime. So you can just, uh, if you have the Prime, uh, whatever it's called, the Kindle Prime. You can also get everything if you want it autographed from me or whatever. You can get it from drakeu.com. That's just my last name, Drake, and the letter u.com. There's a ton of stuff going on at Drake U. I'm doing, I talked about the Drake Brutal, uh, Brutal Breakdown, so I'm breaking down things. I'm going to, after this interview, I'm actually heading out the door to go watch it. Uh, okay. And then I'm going to do a breakdown on it this yep. weekend, and that'll be next week's. Um, I think American Assassin, I've, I've decided, is going to be the next one after that. Uh, looks interesting because I watch a movie every week. So yeah. now I'm just, just doing the breakdown. Um, the, uh, the There's blogs on it. There's um, We're doing a bunch of – I'm doing free online classes. I am doing paid online classes as well. I just finished up a three-part uh, series uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I did two, two and a half hours of classes every night um, for paid attendees. But I'm also doing free classes. Uh, if you join the uh, Drake U, it just costs your email address. Um, I'm doing free Q&As. The next Q&A is coming up on the 20th. So if you want to come in and chat with me live and ask me questions about whatever, um, I'm going to spend a couple hours just sitting around you know, fielding questions and so on and so forth. I'm doing that every month. So that's online. Anybody can, can join that as long as you're, it, it is a part of the, uh, you have to be a subscriber to Drake U to, to get in. Um, but as long as you're a member of Drake U, which doesn't cost anything, you'll get access to all this stuff. So a lot of stuff is going on with Drake U. Again, I hired a team of people that are, are really pushing this and, and taking my theories and, and how I teach and everything like that to a much wider audience than what I've been reaching just all by myself. Yeah. So that's really that's really kind of the thing that I'm working on. Uh, if you follow me on social media, uh, obviously, as soon as things work out, like this TV show that I talked about, if it actually does sell, I will definitely be touting that uh, every single day. If this you know book contract <laughs> goes through, obviously, I'll be uh, spreading the news of, of that. I'll be very excited to get back into those into those arenas. But um, but yeah, the, the nonfiction stuff, the teaching stuff is what I've been concentrating on the most over these last uh, 18 months or so. Uh, I'm defi I definitely encourage you know writers that are listening to uh, pick up your books because they are just, just so much information that's helpful to write fiction. So yeah. Well, and thanks so much just for taking the time today, Jay. Uh, just really appreciate uh, talking to you and your insight and you know tips for writers. Oh, I appreciate being on here. Have me back anytime.